Afrofuturism is the central theme of Michigan State University's second annual Juneteenth celebration. Juneteenth on June 19th is a federal holiday that commemorates the emancipation of enslaved African Americans in the United States. This year's keynote speaker is College of Arts and Letters English professor Julian Chambliss, who has a focus on popular culture, comics, and digital humanities, and his research explores race, identity, and power in urban spaces. His address is titled, Not Only Darkness, The Legacy and Future of Black Speculative Practice. Dr. Chambliss's keynote will focus on Afrofuturism, what it is, and its impact on society today. His keynote will also examine the relationship between Afrofuturism and speculative practice, which refers to the exploration of new ideas and pathways that will ultimately lead to liberation. And it's great to welcome Dr. Chambliss back to MSU today. Hello, sir. <laughs> Hello. Thanks for having me back. You know, I touched on it, but describe your background a little bit and your research interests and how you originally got in, got those interests. Yeah, I'm. I'm. My degree is actually in history. I'm a historian by training. Um, my work at MSU. I was hired here in 2018 as part of the Consortium for Critical Diversity and Digital Age Research, which you know goes by Cedar. And my work is on. I often just say it's on real and imagined spaces. So sometimes the real spaces are historically black spaces. Sometimes the imaginary spaces are Wakanda, right? Like it's comics digital humanities. I got involved in Afrofuturism through my work in comics because I write about Black Panther and think about um, black spaces and uh, trying to come to terms with um, the centrality of comics and Afrofuturism has led me to think about it a lot. I created a show here. I'm also the Val Berman Curator of History at the MSG Museum. And our, my recent show was um, Beyond the Black Panther, ironically, uh, Visions of Afrofuturism in American Comics. And that was really inspired by that original narrative in the original essay where the man who coined the term Afrofuturism, Mark Derry, said that, you know, it was percolating in black drawn and black created comic books. And I really wanted to explore the idea in the context of contemporary comics. And so that show has is, is, is been up for a while and we, we weathered the, co the COVID uh, challenge. Uh, we got a, a grant from the Michigan Humanities Council to make that show happen. So it's just both virtually and, and there's a physical element that I think is still up in the museum. Um, so, you know, when I teach a class, I teach an integrated arts and humanities class, what we call IH, a sort of, you know, gen ed class, if you remember in college days, your general education curriculum. I teach one of those classes that's about Afrofuturism. And so, you know, I, I think about Afrofuturism a lot, I've written about it, I sort of work in it in a way in in the sense that I, I deal with both speculative and real real things in the context of my work and think about transformation and liberation so it makes some sense maybe you know we'll see how people feel at the end so <laughs> so what is afrofuturism and what has been that impact on society that i mentioned in the intro well you know afrofuturism is um i describe it as the intersection between speculation and liberation born of uh, African diasporic experiences. And it often touches on, you know, science, technology, and knowledge production um, and, and how we do that and, and, and what are our aims for that. And ultimately, Afrofuturism is really, you know, rooted in a set of concerns that are connected to the, the Black experience. You know, it's theorized through by people who are concerned with hierarchies and control and oppression and are looking through ways to, to create a system that's less hierarchical, less less oppressive, more equitable, more safe. And I think ultimately the impact of that, that there is a group of people, regardless of discipline, who are sort of committed to the idea of trying to create a more equitable, safe society is the thing that makes Afrofuturism so appealing because obviously that project does not require you to be black. It just simply that the theorizing around Afrofuturism is rooted in a set of people who understand or, or come to understand the complexities of race as sort of constructed in a, in, in the Western context, which is exploitive, right? It's connected to colonialism. If you're thinking through that system, you think about the legacy of that system, what you're trying to do is dismantle a system that um, does 
peg identity, does peg gender as his ways of control. And if you if you can stop that, then you you open the door for a system that's more equitable, a system that's safer for everyone, black, white, brown, everybody. And what is speculative practice, and what is its relationship with Afrofuturism? Well, Afrofuturism is a term that's really describing spec black speculative okay. practice, right? So. Um, this is this is one of the great things about college, right? I always always like tell my students like stuff that happens to you in high school isn't gonna happen to you in college. College is different, right? And college is different because like we like think about big things. And one of the big things we think about is like what is the meaning of things? How does knowledge get created? And so the term Afrofuturism actually was really important when it was coined in 1994 because it captured a set of practices that black people were doing, but in the nature of a kind of hierarchical system, black people's contributions, actions, perspectives get erased, right? And so what, what the term does is it calls attention to like, oh yes, black people have had to speculate around liberation over and over again because the system they, they've been involved in is unequal so they're thinking about ways to make it more equal. Right? And, and and the consequence of that, you know, we we can easily laud in terms of the American experience, right? Like it's very difficult for us to think about the United States today without the without the context of African Americans, right? Like it's for you know, in, in moments both good and ill, slavery is an ill, the good is it is coming to an end, right? And so, you know, African Americans have been a part of this country from the beginning. And their contributions in every, every one of those stages is something that we can't really deny. Now talk about the significance of Juneteenth and more about how commemorating it has evolved. We, when we think about Juneteenth in, in the context of um, sort of black speculative practice, it's really one of the things I think Afrofuturism asks people to do is it asks people to decenter a kind of Eurocentric approach. And again, I, I go back to like talking to students about this. Like, you know, my whole example is the fish. Like if you're a fish and you're swimming and you're just minding your own business and then one day somebody drops this thing in front of you and, like, oh, and you bite it and you get willed out and like, you know, lucky enough it's a catch and release, but like, you know, a fisherman has you. He's like, ah, this is a great fish. And he throws you back and then you go to your friends and you go, dude, there's something totally different out there. And they're like, what are you talking about? Like, look. You don't, there's a different world. There's a completely different world. It's a completely different. We live in a system where we're immersed in a set of assumptions, ideas, precepts, and Afrofuturism is decentering those precepts because all those assumptions, ideas, and precepts are sort of Eurocentric, right? They're, they're predicated on a set of ideas that are derived from the age of discovery, exploitation, the sort of... Um, pulling wealth and bodies and you know, just creating empires. And even though, though that period is over, the legacies of that persist, right? Like we, we have certain assumptions that that we, we tie to the past that we think that they're good, but are they, right? Like we ask these questions. And so one way that we have to, that I think, take into account um, commemoration, memory, celebration in American context, like, you know, for African-Americans, there's a whole different set of celebratory moments that are very important to their experience, right? Um, in the 19th century, African Americans commemorated the end of the transatlantic slave trade, right? Even though slavery was still going on, like we you know in the records, free African Americans talked about, you know, it is a great thing when the transatlantic slave trade stopped. Stop. I use air quotes because you know historians be like, you know, like I know, I know, I know. <laughs> like, um, and it's not unreasonable for African Americans um, to commemorate emancipation. It's not unreasonable for African Americans to commemorate the end of slavery. It's not unreasonable for African Americans to commemorate the you know the sort of destruction of uh, the Confederacy. Right? Like these are all bad things that were. Uh, uh, going against the ideology of the United States by by the words of Americans at the time, like this is wrong, right? Uh, and so Juneteenth is a particular, a particularly complex holiday, in part because I think it, it has come to the center of, of public awareness 
at a time when African Americans are increasingly articulating uh, a set of understandings about the nature of a, a coercive society, right? Like a systemic anti-blackness in a, in a new way. In the sense that, you know, one of the things about previous moments of civil rights and, and social justice activism by African Americans is that the assumption on the part of white people is that these black people are advocating to be just like us, right? And I think one of the things that's really interesting about Juneteenth is that there is there is a an idea of commemoration within it that is celebrating the sort of triumphs of African Americans in a very particular context, and it's celebrating that that context unapologetically. I would argue, right? like this is a holiday that's very well known, or a commemoration very well known within the Black community, but it's only recently become a federal holiday. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that we had a black president. So celebrating blackness, you know, is, is okay. Um, you know, I think some of the backlash that we have in terms of like that moment of like blackness being at the center of American context is something that we, we, we're dealing with to, to this very day. But, you know, at some very basic level, you know, Juneteenth represents a celebration of the end of a, a horrible system and, and for people of African descent and their allies, that's a very important thing, right? It was a horrible thing. Let's celebrate its end. Um, that has not necessarily been the case in the public square for decades upon decades upon decades, right? Like, you know, only in the United States do the the losers and the insurrectionists, you know, rebellious thing have statues and things like that. Right? Like, like, most of the time, like, no, no, no. But yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, there's, there makes a lot of sense to say, hey, like, you know, let, let's celebrate this thing and celebrate its perspective on the American experience. And how do Juneteenth and Afrofuturism fit together and complement each other? Well, you know, that ideology of decentering your Eurocentric ideas means that there is always a a consideration of the past that's integral to Afrofuturism. Recovery of the past, because one of the things that was intrinsic to the colonial system is the erasure of people of color. They're you know the you know, they are objects in that system. And so their contribution, their voices, their their abilities are are only understood within the context of like what can be exploited from them, be it labor, be it whatever. And with Afrofuturism, there's an element of like going back and recover the the reality, like the knowledge, the production, the, the contributions of people of color. And there's also, as I say, you know, thinking about the shifting the perspective from a kind of Eurocentric one to a more open, diverse one. And so in a more open, diverse society, you know, obviously celebrating a sort of major milestone related to African-American freedom and, of course, its contributions to the broader American context, right? Because, again, one of the benefits of African-American speculation around liberation is, like, really a more liberal society, a more equal society for everybody. And and that is that is also something that we can all, as Americans, agree on and understand. And uh, what are some key messages you hope to convey in your talk at MSU's Juneteenth celebration? This, this was it right here. Yeah. Like, like, right, like, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to define Afrofuturism, and I'm going to try to be um, very accurate <laughs> in terms of, you know, dates and things like that, like, you know, very histor historical. But, uh, you know, try to define what it is trying to to make clear like this sort of transformation this sort of shift in perspective that is represented by it and how juneteenth and and really commemoration and memory from a, a sort of african-american or african diasporic perspective is different but not but in in that difference is i think a kind of affirmation of the ideology of liberation that's very important to the united states right there's there's an element here where um you know the black experience is american history too and commemoration around the black experience is an American commemoration. Uh, it is not unreasonable for every American to like celebrate their fellow Americans, you know, feeling of like pleasure about the end of a, a great evil. And, and I think that's one of the things about Juneteenth that's particularly interesting because, you know, the, the story of Juneteenth is very particular in the sense that it's not exactly celebrating emancipation. Emancipation is celebrating the moment 
that people in Texas find out about emancipation. And so, you know, in an era of like viral messaging and and like instant transfer of ideas, both good and bad, you have to stop and think, you know, in, in January 1865, they passed the 13th Amendment. It's not till June that these people in Texas know that they're free. So, you know, the question I always ask is a student is like, if, if you, are you free if you don't know you're free? And in, with Juneteenth, there's a moment here where, where we're seeing literally the end of like a, a, an oppressive system crystallized in a particular moment, right? Like the news reaches these people, these are the farthest reaches of the, the Confederacy. That's when it's over when everybody knows that's when it's over. And the idea that there's like a, a a kind of element of truth made real by a particular moment when information arrives, when the the order is made, you know, sort of said out loud, like that's that's the moment. That's the clarion call that, that rings the bell, that that's the end of the evil. And you can point to it right like you know sometimes when things going bad and you're making a turn you don't ever from a historical standpoint there's just moments where like it did it doesn't like have a definitive stop it just doesn't seem as bad anymore right think about the pandemic is the pandemic over no some people ain't over some people i mean like it's that's a that that is a, a historical contemporary where like you know we're, we're over here but some things that are bad there's a way that history says it's over war but this is one of those things there's a great human suffering and we can point to it like you know this is the moment and i think that 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 resonates with people in a very particular way and Dr. Chambliss, I recall you and I and your colleague Jeff Ray sitting here a couple of years ago in Black History Month in 2020. Right, yeah. You said something that still sticks with me. Every month is Black History Month, and Black History is American history. You've right. kind of touched on that a couple of times, but just explore that a little more for me. Well, I, you know, I think the one of the things that's been fundamental to African-American experience is a reclaiming of history. You know, when I when I teach this course on Afrofuturism, I do spend a lot of time with with history, because the justification for Afrofuturism, at some level, by Mark Derry, does touch on history. Like one of the things he says when he's sort of working his way towards identifying his term is that Black people live in a sci-fi nightmare, right? Like they they live in a world where impassable force fields of intolerance bar their movement. Technology is brought to bear on on them, and and then the language he's using is the language of science fiction. But the history that he's referencing there is real, right? Like black peoples are adopted by strangers and thrown, and like you know, and the the, the sort of trope of the middle patches is like you know some sort of like horrific space travel or all all that's real. The technology everything from branding to restraints to, you know, sterilization. I mean, like, you can just sort of trace experimentation. Like, it just technology is bare on black bodies. So it's, it's difficult, I think, for anyone who knows anything about American history to think, like, black people aren't a part of that history. They are, but their perspective is so different. So it's uncomfortable. So it's easy, I think, for, in, in the context of, of American history narrative, that, the way that it's told is told through through a lens of like white people feeling better about that history, whereas white people don't have that don't have that luxury in part because you know as as futurists argue they live with the legacy of that bad thing all the time. You know they still have invisible fields of force that bar there. They still see technology. You know, our, you know, facial recognition technology does not work well on black faces. We know. People at MSU know, like we study, it, it does not work, right? Uh, like we, 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 like we, we kind of, we, 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 we made this case. Um, and so 
for us, for, for, for scholars, for people who are thinking about the, the nature of the system, this idea that the American experience has these down, these down points, but also has these high points, right? So it's, it's cyclical. There's a truth that we, we need to tell. And the reason that truth is important because it leads to reconciliation, right? Um, the, the, the American experience is integrated into the, in, into the black experience, the black experience integrated into the American experience. The nature of those integrations, though, if when you tell it from the black perspective, it is this sort of like speculation around liberation. It is pushing towards, hey, you say you have this idea. Do you live up to this idea? Right. And and the con you know, the, the consequences of that is that, you know, you have a more 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 liberal society, like you have a more a more open society, you have a, a society of more freedom because black people are going like this ain't right. Right? Like people on the margins going this ain't right. Right. And 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 the re and the result of that, the net result of that is like it's a more free society for everybody. But we don't tell it that way because like that's not that's not necessarily a feel good national narrative. But that perspective that that's not a feel-good national narrative is also a very particular perspective because you can make an argument like, yeah, despite everything, we get there. We we have, we have moved the the needle towards free, right? Which all the great orators <laughs> like bending towards freedom all the time. And so you know, the black black history is American history is a is a history that tells of struggle and strife. But the, but that struggle and strife gets you a better world, and I and I think if we thought about it that way, then we have a better a better sense of why you know Black history or Chicano history or all, all the histories of the people on the margins matter because those are the people who have to like ideate around what's it mean to be free, right? Because like they're at the bottom, they're on the outside. And it's just like, you know, what does it mean to be free in a system where I know where my lived experiences tell me I'm not, I'm not free. And, and that becomes like, you know, the real, the real trauma. And of course it plays itself out every day now. Um, it is not unreasonable to make a connection between that kind of zeal and explosion of interest in Afrofuturism, but also the kind of like reactionary feelings that you see in politics, right? In, in part because with those voices taking up space in the public sphere, this question of like, what is the truth of the American experience is being asked. And, and you have to process that. And you know, the good thing about this is that like we have places like MSU where people, you know, their job is to process things. Like our job is to process things. <laughs> like, like our job is to go like, uh, this, 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 right? Um, that's not how, how it's sometimes described, but that's kind of like what our job is, is to process things. Yeah. So, so to make it easier for people. So hopefully people, people come away with like a sense of clarity, better sense of clarity. I don't know, I don't know any professor can ever make everything very clear. <laughs> right. And you know, Julian, we're speaking on the MSU Today podcast. You're a podcaster yourself. Yeah. Tell me about your podcast and, and what do you like about this medium for getting uh, your message out? Yeah, you know, we I run the um, the Graphic Possibilities Research Workshop, which is a comics research workshop in in the English department. The English department actually has several works, you know, research workshops, but I do the one on comics. And I'm the faculty lead. I have... Um, graduate student co-leads and we do a podcast called the graphic possibilities podcast which you can get where all your podcasts are sold i'll <laughs> give it away and we we talk to people about teaching and making related to comics and we do this in in a variety of ways we we, we talk to artists we talk to scholars we, we talk to people like john jennings who's a Eisner Award winner, the guy who's adapting Octavia Butler's um, novels into graphic novels, him and his collaborator, Damon Duffy. Um, we talked to the scholars of, of comics like Nick Susanis, who's one of the first people to do a dissertation as a graphic novel. Um, we we, we talked to these people to try to understand um, the theory and practice of comics. And and we do that uh, in, using the podcast form because, of course, the podcast is very it's very open format, right? Um, people can consume a lot of podcasts. I consume a lot of podcasts. 
And I think the audio format uh, is more accessible for the interview subject in a way. Uh, recently, we this led during COVID, uh, which is why we started a podcast. Uh, we started a podcast because of COVID. You know, like we, people can't come to campus, so we're gonna have to we have to record them. And and we do a video component, but because we use Zoom, but we always release the audio as a podcast. And 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 I think it is, you know, there's a, there was a moment where I was like, we're gonna do a podcast about comics, you know, pictures. Comics are worse than pictures. But I do think having the opportunity to talk to people about their work, talk to them about their inspirations, their practice, to sort of think through the implications of their work. You know, for artists, we often ask them, like, if you were going to teach or talk to a teacher about your work, what would you say? And, and that's always really interesting to hear them think through, like, oh, okay. Um, and then for scholars, you know, why are comics such a powerful medium for education? And as someone who teaches comics classes as well, I'm like, I, I totally understand um, uh, the validity of this. And so the Graphic Possibilities podcast is is an opportunity to sort of like explore the question of teaching and, and learning related to comics and, and practice related to comics. And I, and I think, you know, we get a small but dedicated audience and that's really important. We try to integrate that into other digital projects that we have. We have a Graphic Possibilities uh, open educational resource like which is like a kind of like guide that we that we created for the library so if you want to study comics you know how would you go about it when well, we sort of thought through and created a kind of website that you know students could go to or even scholars could go to so they could think through these things and recently we actually started doing little audio interviews with experts in subfields in comics very short things where they describe a subfield. So like, let's say you do um, politics and comics and, and they sort of like talk through, this is why that's important. And, and we're doing, and we did that audio in part because, you know, that's a little short snippet that we can release, but it also, you know, helps the sort of bibliography that's associated with that subfield, even make it even more accessible. Um, where I'm a big proponent of open access, uh, and then for students, my like my IH course, my futures of course is paperless, so it's there are no books. It's all free. Like you just when you get there, it's all there. Uh, I, I'm a big believer in, in making it paperless, so they don't have to pay for for anything. <laughs> but they, that means they have to read a bunch of stuff, and they don't have the excuse like I couldn't get the book. Like that's not that's not gonna work here, right? Like this is a paperless class. Um, but you know. Even that is a, a kind of that is a question of like structures and 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 hierarchies and and power, right? Like if you're, you know, books cost a lot of money as an undergraduate, and certain fields they cost even more money, right? And so, what can you do to lower the barrier in terms of like getting people access to the information is a, a legitimate question, and it's a question that like people in academia talk about all the time. Like, what are we going to do in terms of like we know how much it costs. We're trying to do, we're trying to make it better, right? Um, which goes back to the idea, you know, like you could be an Afrofuturist in any any context, right? Uh, students often ask me that, and I, I had a student this last semester who's a nursing student, and he wanted to know like. You know how do how would I be Afrofuturist if I was a nurse? And I'm like, well, you know, Afrofuturism is about structure. And if you think about the practice that's associated with what the work that you do, can you think about ways to make it more liberatory, like make it more open, make it more equitable, make sure people are safe? And then you're being Afrofuturist. I'm like, oh, okay, okay, you can do it. <laughs> All right. So, you know, we're the podcast and and access through digital means are an important part of. Um, what I do and, and what a lot of people at MSU do, of course, you know, MSU is a home for digital humanities work and we have a digital humanities um, sort of division headed by Kathleen Fitzpatrick and, you know, there are lots of work groups in that, like like my CEDAR leader. Um, why? I mean, like, there's a lot, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of them, a lot of acronyms. Um, so, you know, like I say, like, you know, our job, places like MSU, Big Land Grant University, you know, it's a public, it's a public interest situation like our job is to sort of think 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 and try to explain 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 right uh so that's not always simple but that's kind of like that's kind of like what we do like think 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 try to explain 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 right so 
hopefully it's working. Yeah. <laughs> and tell me about Afrofantastic.com. You know, I do so much stuff with Afrofuturism. When I did my very first um, curated show, it was about Afrofuturism. This was way back, way back. It was like 2017. Um, and I wanted, and I came with that, the word Afrofantastic, because I was like, I don't want to call the show Afrofuturism. That is a misnomer. That's not exactly right. And so Afrofantastic was the name of the class. I called the name of the class the name of the show. And so I just kept it. I'm like, nobody, no one's going to, Nobody's got copyright here. I, this is mine. I, I'm just gonna keep it, and so that's why the IH course is called Afro Fantastic. And I do so much, so many things around Afro Futurism that I was like, well, and I do get asked about it a lot. I get asked a lot about comics. Whenever something happens with comics, my friends are the first people like, hey, did you see? Oh yeah, I saw. Like, what did you think? Like, okay. Uh, like it doesn't matter what it is. Like, you see Miss Marvel? Yeah, yeah, that's all. Right. Okay, I, I, I see it. I see it. Um, so, but after futurism, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna make a website, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna put all of it there. Like, I just gonna put everything together. And I, I'm as a curator, I, I've, I've curated the show at MSU Museum, but I'm also right now serving as a curator for the Zora Neale Hurston Festival of the Arts and Humanities, which is a, you know one of the oldest African-American arts and cultural festivals in, in the United States, which is is takes place in Edenville, Florida, which is the home of Zora Neale Hurston. It's a very important sort of literary figure. Um, and they plan that, that festival in five-year cycles. And the cycle right now, 2020 to 2024, is that for futurism. So every year I'm sort of like, curating a whole set of programming um, that is Afrofuturist. And that was another reason, like, I need to put, you know, all this stuff together, because I've, I've curated exhibitions at the Zorna Hurston um, National Museum of Fine Arts, which is in Eatonville, small small space in Eatonville. And um, so I'm just bringing all the sort of Afrofuturist things together on our Afro Fantastic. Like, I have a newsletter there. Like, if you go there, you can sort of sign up for a newsletter, and I, I sort of talk through um uh different afrofuturist things i I often use a, a kind of set set of like legacy science you know community gender um spiritualism metaphysics as a way to sort of like you know really call attention to the broad sort of epistemological landscape around afrofuturism and you can always see it right like once once you once you have the framework you can always see it is my my argument to students and because my my Afrofantastic course is an introduction to Afrofuturism for for undergraduates who so I assume they know nothing, right? I assume you, you don't know anything. So we we do like the very basic, like this is a definition, right? Like, this is a more complicated version of that definition, right? Because you know, as a theoretical, as a as a movement, it has different eras of theorization, as all movements do, right? Like. Adam Smith is not the last word on capitalism. There have been plenty of other people who talked about capitalism since Adam Smith, right? So it's like, okay, like this is the first definition. Now here's a person who refines that definition. Here's a person who refines that definition. And this is an expression of that in different media. Well, this is that expression in sound. This is that expression in art. This is that expression in community. And so, you know, to try to get them a sense of like, hey, this is how sort of black speculative practice actually operates in the past, present, present, past, future, right? Like, this is how it works. Well, Dr. Julian Chambliss, thank you for this enlightening conversation. And just as we close, sort of just some final thoughts you want to leave with those joining in on our conversation on Juneteenth, Afrofuturism, Black Speculative Practice, just yeah, some concluding sure. thoughts. Yeah, I think, you know, I I, I appreciate the, the committee's decision to to pursue Afrofuturism as a, a theme for the Juneteenth celebration. I think... It's very appropriate for an institution like MSU, which as I alluded to, you know, our job is to sort of like think through complex issues and try to try to make make knowledge accessible to the public. You know, that's kind of like our, our mission, raise on raise on And so, you know, I think it's a, a great opportunity for the implications of black speculative practice, right? The implications of like what does it mean to speculate speculate around liberation. To, to be brought to people in a variety of forms because the program itself is diverse because the practice is diverse, right? And, you know, even my little talking head part is really only, it's only one way you are you can be invited in. And hopefully people will come away from this as, with the opportunity to think more about 
Afrofuturism and think more about the ways that 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 speculation around liberation has a positive impact in their world. And I think ultimately we all, every American, black, white, whatever, um, can see the benefits of people on the margins speculating about what makes for a more liberatory system. Oh, great. Well, again, thank you for coming in, and I enjoyed the conversation. Ah, thanks a lot. That's Dr. Julian Chambliss, a College of Arts and Letters English professor, and he's the keynote speaker at Michigan State University's 2022 Juneteenth celebration. He will deliver an address titled, Not Only Darkness, the Legacy and Future of Black Speculative Practice. And I'm Russ White. This is MSU Today.